I was asked to join on a project that had um, that had already been completed. The data collection had already been completed, and I was asked to come on board to help um, a friend and colleague to to basically get this paper over the line, get it published. And I said, sure, no problems. But there was a problem. And the problem was that my friend had been given bad advice. On what was necessary during the data collection. And we were missing a very important part of, of the method that you need in order to get it published. And it didn't matter which way I pitched it and who I pitched it to, that the, I had to be just straight up with, yep, this bit is missing. In the end, we had to go back and redo stuff and it took many months, a lot longer than I anticipated or that I thought I had signed up for. And uh, I felt that it was not the quality that I was looking for. And this reminds me very much of a conversation that I had with Lyndall Strasdens when I was at the ANU about 10 years ago. She said to um, a room full of PhD students and postdocs, she said to us, it is absolutely worth spending 10 years on getting one paper and making that paper the best thing you've ever written. If you write 6,000 things that are just, you know, you whip them out and they're really quite rubbish, then you're not going to get the citations and people will think you're a rubbish researcher, so why bother wasting your time anyway? Always, she said, always, it is worth doing quality over quantity. And when somebody is looking at your resume and considering you for the next steps, always that is what is in their mind. Has this person done something of quality? Are they in a quality journal? Is this a, um, a great piece of work? Or is it just some stuff that they managed to get published? Um, I was, I felt quite burnt from that experience and um, frustrated that I had wasted my time on something that became apparent to me quite early on that it was not the kind of quality that I wanted to be engaged in. And so it was a good learning experience for me in terms of finding those things that I know um, are important to me. Now I can see the intrinsic value of the article on that. And I may have to be working on five different articles at the same time. Um, and these other four I do because I have to do them. But this one here, I know that's my gold. That's my gold nugget. And I make sure that I'm putting in all, all the right bells and whistles to make that soar. Um, and I think it's always a good idea to have to have that going on, that you have something that you um, are passionate about, that you have some control over the direction of it. So maybe you're a lead author on it. Um, maybe your first, second or final author on that piece. And you that way you can really direct the sales and pick up the wind and move it through. Sorry, I didn't mean to whistle just then. <laughs> anyway, this is now a whistling session. Story number three. The two-year cultural safety, uh, cultural competence, hard slog. So for those of you who are still with us, stay with me. It's going to get better. But um, I'm going to give you another story that is a about um, finding my feet. I was sitting 
on the cricket stand in the Auckland domain and it was a sunny day and it was a near Christmas time and I was sitting with a good friend and colleague and saying to her that I was feeling very angsty about cultural safety and cultural competence not because I didn't know what these terms were, but because I felt that many people were using them in ways that were at odds with all of the body of literature that I had been reading. This is where we're at. Anyway, there I was on the cricket stand telling my friends that I was feeling very frustrated at the way that the conversations were going around cultural safety and cultural competence in the international literature on this subject. And I was trying to explain to her that my personal view is that we can do things that are culturally safe, we can do things to promote cultural safety. And some of those things that we do feel a bit tokenistic, feel a bit naff, feel that, that, that some of them are just simply really basic and easy to achieve. And others are very difficult to achieve. Others will take us to spaces where we feel vulnerable and um, frustrated and then it suddenly dawned on me while we were sitting there I said to her oh it's like a reef it's like the ocean where cultural safety and the things that we do to promote it there's those things that we can see that are up at the top layer, you know, those first few meters on the reef where it's getting all the sunlight and we've got all the fish in there and the corals and the, the fan corals, the horn corals, the brain corals. And we've got every kind of fish. We've got clownfish, we've got um, puffer fish, we've got starfish, all of this neat magical stuff that's up there and easy to see and easy to, um, to demonstrate. And then we go deeper into the water, into that twilight zone where the sun's light is not getting through so much and it's harder to see. It's harder to see the things um, that we're doing to promote cultural safety. And it's harder to see those things that we might be a little bit afraid of like discriminatory practices toward ourselves. Um, and that's when it becomes very, very difficult to look at things like unconscious bias. It's a bit harder, it's a bit colder. And then you go down to the midnight zone and way down there in the midnight zone, there are some freaky looking fish, sharks, like goblin sharks. Those are freaky. And they could be right beside you and you don't even know they're there. And that can be um, quite difficult as well. And there's all these jellies and like sword sail, um, what are they called, oarfish? Oh my gosh, there's all kinds of stuff down there. Anyway, giant squid, the, the, the works, the works, right? But my point is, it's pitch black down there. And it can be very difficult to know which direction you're going. And in terms of cultural safety, this metaphor continues to work because that's when you're actually trying to do things that are systemic, that are responsive to others, right? Like you're getting way well out of your comfort zone and going into a responsive safe space that is difficult to achieve. And there are 6 million walls, you know, up. There are all of these cliffs and, and ravines and, you know, the deepest ravine on earth is in the ocean. It's all of that. So it's the Marianas Trench. You're right down there and, and it's difficult stuff. So that was my metaphor. And it was a bit of a moment for me where I was like, wow, that sounded really brainy and everything. And my friend said to me, well, why don't you just write that then? So I did. And then I, I sent it to some friends and asked them to critique it, to check if it was any good um, and got feedback from them and worked it in and worked it in and made it into a piece that is entirely a metaphor for cultural safety built on the three zones of the ocean. 
And I do believe that the metaphor itself is useful for people understanding the the complexities of cultural safety and cultural um, competence and cultural responsiveness. But I was unable to convince the editor of this. So the first journal I sent it to, I got whiplash when they sent it back and said, nah, reject. And then, um, because it's a it's a conversational piece, and nobody's publishing conversational pieces these days. Seriously, who is doing that? Nobody. Trust me on this. And um, or if they are, you've got like you know 300 words in which to say your epiphany. <laughs> and uh, that didn't work for me, so it was rejected. So I resubmitted it, and then it was rejected. So I resubmitted it, and then it was rejected with um, lots of comments. So I worked all those comments in, and then it was rejected. And then I went to a new journal and tried again, and they said major revision, and then I did major revision, and then they said minor revision, and I thought, oh, thank God, finally, finally, we're here, people. And then they rejected it. And at this point, I thought, is it political? Is what I'm saying is the audience just wrong? If I pitched it to the wrong audience, what I wanted to achieve was something that was going to be in a bigger space with more readers where I can make most effect. And that's not what ended up happening because I started at the top, right? Like aim for the stars and, um, and then landed in a grass paddock somewhere where it was the um, a debate Right, so literally, it's it's in the debate section of a journal, BMC Medical Education, which is an okay journal. And I felt frustrated that it had to go into the debate section because I thought I actually have done a lot of hard slog on this and I really don't want to invite debate. <laughs> but in any case, it was the place that ended up accepting it. And so that is where it got published. And I'm grateful to say, it hasn't received a whole lot of debate just yet. Phew. But what was useful to me and the learning that I took away from this journey is that metaphors can work really well and can serve you well, especially when you're dealing with complex things. And uh, the other thing that was really useful was that um, to stick with it. When you know it's good, don't be deterred stick with it because that is actually um, worth doing and when you get major revision and you get lots of comments it's because the person who read it saw enough value in it to give you some useful pointers on how you can make it better. I realized about 14 years ago that there was this guy called Clifford Getz. And he writes in a compelling, engaging, beautiful, articulate, considered, intelligent way. And I like it. He's quite famous for saying this. Man is an animal suspended in webs of significance that he himself has spun. Cultural analysis is intrinsically incomplete. And worse than that, the more deeply it goes, the less complete it is. When I started reading Clifford Getz, I realized that this person wrote in such a way that I really wanted to be able to be like him when I grow up. I want to be able to write like that. Uh, it's almost like poetry, except people take it seriously. <laughs> That's the key difference, I think. <laughs> but um, <laughs> but he has um, really intelligent things to say. And the way that he tells his stories is very considered. So um, I would invite you 
to think about things when you read other people's writing in your field. Notice. Notice the person, notice the author that writes in a way that you're like, wow, that's amazing. I want to write like that. And notice what it is that they are doing that you want to do, that you want to emulate in your own writing, and then practice it. That's what I have done. And I'm not anywhere near as good a writer as Clifford gets, but I think it is useful for me to have that you know, imaginary mentor, that goal, that that person in mind, that author to help me to to write in creative ways. So he wrote in the thick description towards an interpretive theory of culture. This is how he begins. In her book, Philosophy is a New Key, Suzanne Langer remarks that certain ideas burst upon the intellectual landscape with a tremendous force. They resolve so many fundamental problems at once that they seem almost to promise that they will resolve all fundamental problems, clarify all obscure issues. Everyone snaps them up as the open sesame of some new positive science, the conceptual center point around which a comprehensive system of analysis can be built. The sudden vogue of such a grand idea crowding out almost everything else for a while is due, she says, to the fact that all sensitive and active minds turn to once to exploiting it. We try it in every connection, for every purpose, experiment, with every possible stretch in its strict meaning with generalizations and derivatives. After we have become familiar with the new idea, however, after it has become part of our general stock of theoretical concepts, our expectations are brought more into balance with its actual uses and its excessive popularity is ended. A few zealots persist in the old key to the universe view of it, but less driven thinkers settle down after a while to the problems the idea has really generated. Okay, so I'm going to leave there and invite your thoughts. <laughs>